A better generation. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa makes parents responsible for inculcating the principles of the Buddhist faith to create a more nationally conscious next generation. In demand, Sri Lanka plays host to representatives of the world's biggest superpowers from tomorrow, all eager to discuss bilateral relations and development. The road to success calls for a country-based market development strategy that paves way to liberalization. A market development strategy that lays out a path to liberalization in certain areas. A legend departs. The entire country bids farewell to stage and television icon Jailak Manu Ratna. All this and much more coming up on this Sunday, the 12th of January 2020. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine. It always feels good when you are appreciated. SLT Non-Stop Broadband. Free loyalty data added as you stay connected. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. A very good evening. Welcome, this is First at Nine. And moving on to your top stories for tonight. Addressing the felicitation ceremony of the newly appointed Chief Prelate of the Western Province, Venerable Gona Dube Nandathera, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa stressed the importance of strengthening Dhamma schools in order to build a generation of children nourished by Buddhist values. The felicitation ceremony for the newly appointed Chief Prelate of the Western Province, Venerable Gonadue Nyana Nandatera, was held today with the patronage of Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. ප්‍රශ්නයක් Opposition leader Sajid Primadasa once again reiterated his eagerness to work in unison with President Kotabi Rajapaksa towards the revival and economic development of the country. Now, addressing a public gathering in Kasbah yesterday, the opposition leader called for broad public support to become the country's next premier in the upcoming parliamentary election, while adding that he is unwilling to divide the party for the sake of positions. Opposition leader Sajid Primadasa attended a public gathering held in Kasbah yesterday. ඉතිහාසෙන් ඔප්පු වෙලා තිබෙනවා පසු බෑමකට පරාජයකට ලක් වුණයින් පසුව නිවැරදිව සංවිධානය වුණොත් ජයග්‍රහණය කිරීම අපහසුකාරයක් නොවෙයි කියන එක. අපි අදහස් කරනවා සියලුම පක්ෂ පාර්ශවයන් එකතු කරගෙන අපේ ජයග්‍රාහී ගමන ක්‍රියාත්මක කරන්න. අපි මේ පක්ෂය රකින අපි අපේ පක්ෂය ආරක්ෂා කර අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම මහමැතිවරණයේදී පක්ෂයක් කඩලා තනතුරු උදෙසා කැඩෙන්න බෙදෙන්න අපි ලෑස්ති නැහැ ඉදිරි මැතිවරණයේදී ජයග්‍රහණය උපරිමයෙන්ම ලබා ගන්නට මට ලබා දිය හැකි ඉහළම නායකත්වය ලබා දෙන්නට සැදී පැහැදී සිටිනවයි කියන එක ප්‍රකාශ කරන්න නරකද මහමැතිවරණයේදී අපේ පාර්ශ්වයෙන් අගමැතිවරයා පත් කරගත්තාම මට කිසි ප්‍රශ්නයක් නැහැ මම ලෑස්ති ගෝඨාභය රාජපක්ෂ අධිකරු ජනාධිපති එක වැඩ කරන්න කරන්නට හදන උත්සාහ කරන ක්‍රියාදාමයන් වල මහා පරස්පරයක් මම දකින්නෙත් නැහැ ඉතින් අපි ලෑස්ති දෙගොල්ලෝ එකට එක්ක හුවලා සත්‍ය වශයෙන්ම රට හදන්න
Leaving behind a void that, ca that can never be filled, veteran dramatist and actor Jalat Manoratna passed away today, much to the sadness of millions of theatre and television fans. Having suffered from ill health in recent months, the multi-award winning actor was 71 years of age at the time of his death. Born in 1949, Jalat Manoratna is a versatile actor responsible for bringing to life many iconic characters during his television career. Born in Dehipe in the district of Nuri, he was a student of the Hippe Primary School and Poramadulla Central College. He discovered the world of arts making his acting debut in school, starring in a play named Asper Gudung. He has immensely contributed to the Sri Lankan cinema, stage drama and television industries in a career spanning over 50 years. Manoratna was honoured with the Kalasuri and Kalakirti Awards for his services rendered and contributions made to the Sri Lankan entertainment industry. Top diplomats from Russia, China and the US will be visiting Sri Lanka on the 13th and 14th of January and will engage in meetings with both President Gotabe Rajapaksa and Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa as well as other top officials. In a media release from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the ministry revealed that discussions with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Ravlov, Lavrov Lada, will look to rev review bilateral agreements and open new avenues of cooperation in the economic security, education, tourism and science and technology sectors. Chinese Foreign Minister and State Councillor Wang Yi will make a courtesy call on the Sri Lankan Foreign Minister Dinesh Gunavardhana while engaging in formal talks with the President and Prime Minister. Meanwhile, the American Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs, Alice Wells, is to discuss regional issues with the Sri Lankan government, including shared interests in a free and open Indo-Pacific region that fosters prosperity, democracy, justice and human rights. Now, the government is to look at the possibility of using drone technology to combat the dengue scourge working through the Ministry of Science and Technology. State Minister of Technology and Innovation Tilanga Sumatipala, who visited the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technology, has called for attention to be shown to the technology in combating the deadly virus. Discussion in this regard were held during this visit with officials of the institute. This development comes following a recent study by Sri Lankan researchers who successfully used drone technology for aerial inspection to identify mosquito breeding sites and transmit the data to public health inspectors. If implemented, this identification data can be used to release PTI bacteria to the affected sites, also using drone technology. State Minister Secretary, State Ministry Secretary Chintakalokuhetti and Managing Director of the Arthur C. Clarke Institute, Sanat Panvatage, and several others were present during the occasion. More news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back in your business news. Chairman of Asia Securities, Dumit Fernando, emphasizes that a market development strategy, strategy that paves way to liberalization will help mitigate the challenges of policy inconsistency. Speaking to Indivari Amuatta on our current affairs program at Hyde Park on Other Than 24, Fernando suggested that issues relating to bureaucracy and red tape should be addressed while ensuring transparency in the markets. Is it healthy for us to continue to have investors uh, waiting to see what's happening in Sri Lanka? The wait and see now is in fact quite irritating, as you say. But this is exactly what I think investors and frankly not just foreign investors, the local business community is looking for. We're looking for consistency. We're looking for predictability in policy and markets. For us, I think the opportunity now with some of the recent changes, with potentially you know, a strong executive, a strong parliamentary majority, is to make sure that 
we have a policy consistency that we can uh, depend on mm -hmm. uh, and expect that the business community can make investments with good predictability of the outcomes. Uh, and that goes to tax policy, industrial policy and a whole host of other things. This has been a problem for Sri Lanka, regardless of governments in power. But what can we do from the side of the regulator, from the industry side, in order to mitigate these challenges? Yes. I remember in 2000, we look at 2020 and said, we're going to be here. But the question is, how far have we come? We are hitting good macroeconomic numbers, income numbers. Those are all in the right direction. But if you look at the last three years, we've grown at an average of three and a half percent and that's absolutely not where we should be. Number of issues led to that but we need to have a capacity to grow closer to the six percent range and I don't think that is impossible. What we expect once again as regulators a market development strategy that lays out a path to liberalization in certain areas, a path to making it easier to access for investors and a path that allows us to go and promise the world that here is an investment opportunity supported fundamentally by good growth opportunity but also uh, not going to be derailed through road bumps in terms of surprises on regulation or taxes or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Running an economy is a tricky thing so you have to be dynamic. You mentioned about liberalization yeah. but this is not something that we in Sri Lanka accept openly. When you say liberalizing, how far? We have to think hard about the role of the private sector and the role of government. I am not one of those who sits there and always complains about the government not doing something for me. And I don't think the business community should make that their right. default state of being. By liberalization, what I mean is that we need to take away, first of all, the bureaucracy and the red tape where that exists. Secondly, we need to create transparency in markets and access. We also need to think of liberalization in terms of allowing outside knowledge to be brought in here. If you think about the biggest challenge I think we have in the long term is how do we reform our economy to be one that is based on innovation and technology. So we need to think about liberalization in that sense. Some of the steps that need to be taken which are long term have not necessarily panned out. Oil giant Saudi Aramco has said that it has exercised its green shoe option to sell an additional 450 million shares, raising the size of its initial public offering to a record 29.4 billion US dollars. Aramco initially raised 25.6 billion dollars, which was itself a record level in its December IPO, but it indicated it could sell additional shares through the over allotment of shares. However, the green show option or over allotment allows companies to issue more shares in an IPO when there is greater demand from participants in the initial offer. Investors were allocated the additional shares during book building. Further, Aramco said that no additional shares are being offered into the market today and the stabilizing manager will not hold any shares in the company as a result of exercising the over allotment option. Aramco shares have been volatile amid heightened tensions between the United States and Iran, which lies across the Gulf from Saudi Arabia. Now the Sri Lanka stocks closed 1.50% higher last week, pushed by LOLC and generated a 23.6 billion market turnover on John Keel's holdings. Rather, last week the bows ended down due to the tensions prevailing in the Middle Eastern region. However, a positive momentum in the market with strong earnings is expected in the forthcoming week from tomorrow. Let's now take a look at what's in store for the markets in the week ahead. We expect the bond market activity to be slowed down till the first bond auction to be held on the 13th January 2020. And we expect the stock market activity to be slowly pick up in the release of the company's earnings in the following weeks. We expect the market to be positive momentum and expectation of a strong earnings from the companies and which are registering a recovering from the demand. However, foreigners are likely to be a show of selling pressure in the market in coming weeks. International and sports news on the other side of this break. Don't go away.
Welcome back in your international news. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison expresses his regret over the handling of the bushfire crisis that is still ravaging the country. Morrison has faced mounting criticism over his government's response to the bushfires as well as its climate policy. Today, Morrison conceded to some of the public backlash, saying that there were things I could have handled on the ground much better. His statement comes in the wake of nationwide climate change protests on Friday, where protesters demanded further action to be taken to combat the bushfires. In recent weeks, Morrison has also been confronted by angry locals when visiting fire-hit communities in the states of New South Wales and Victoria, where the worst blazes are concentrated. However, the Prime Minister also defended his government's policies, which he claims took into account the effect of climate change on the bushfires. He said in an interview that we are living in longer, hotter, drier summers. This is obviously affected by the broader changes in climate. Acknowledging the pressure fire services were facing, the Prime Minister said there was a new appetite for the government to take a more direct role in responding to the disaster. Morrison said he would seek a Royal Commission review which is a type of public inquiry into the country's response to the bushfire crisis. Now, more than a dozen Saudi servicemen training at U.S. military bases will be expelled from the United States following a review by the Pentagon after the deadly shooting by a Saudi Air Force officer at an American naval base in Florida in December last year. However, the Saudi personnel being expelled are not accused of aiding the Saudi Air Force second lieutenant who killed three American sailors at the Pensacola installation but instead on the grounds of having connections to extremist movements and being in possession of child pornography according to according to sources on 10th december defense department officials halted operational training for saudi military students in the u.s following the attack though classroom instructions continued the pentagon initiated a review of all saudi military trainees in the country, numbering around 850 students and had previously announced that no threat was found. Now, the British Foreign Office confirmed yesterday that the country's ambassador in Tehran was briefly detained by Iranian authorities, denouncing the arrest as a flagrant violation of international law. Earlier, the Tehran-based Tasnim News Agency reported that British envoy Rob Makia was arrested for several hours in front of Amir Kabir University for inciting anti-government protesters. Meanwhile, the British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab said that the arrest of their ambassador in Tehran without grounds or explanation is a flagrant violation of international law. He added that Iranian government is at a crossroads moment and it can continue its march towards pariah status with all, its, with all the political and economic isolation that entails or takes steps to de-escalate tensions and engage in a diplomatic path forwards. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen has secured a second term after a sweeping victory in an election dominated by the issue of islands' relationship with China. Tsai secured just over 57% of the ballot, which was a record 8.2 million votes, resulting in her ending up well as ahead of her rival Han Kyo Yu. The newly re-elected Tsai opposes closer ties with China while her political rival Han suggested they would bring economic benefits. In her victory speech, Tsai told China to abandon its threat to take back the island by force. Tsai told a news conference that Taiwan is showing the world how much we cherish our free democratic way of life and how much we cherish our nation. She added that peace means that China must abandon threats of force against Taiwan. Tsai continues to say that she hopes that the Beijing authorities understand that democratic Taiwan and our democratically elected government will not concede to threats and intimidation. China has claimed sovereignty over Taiwan since the end of the Chinese Civil War in 1949. It says Taiwan must eventually be reunited with China by force if necessary. 
Eight children were among the 11 migrants drowned when their boat sank off Turkey's western coast. Eight other people were rescued from the waters of Sesame, a tourist resort on the coast opposite the Greek island of Kios, where thousands of migrants are living in overcrowded and unsanitary conditions. The Turkish Coast Guard said it responded to screaming sounds from the sea at around 8.30 p.m. yesterday. The nationalities of the dead are not yet known. Turkey has been a key transit point for migrants trying to reach Europe, mainly via Greece. Many are fleeing violence and persecution in their countries, relying on people smugglers and facing dangerous land and sea routes, which often result in death. In 2016, Turkey reached a financial deal with the European Union to stem the flow of migrants and refugees to Europe. The number of people crossing from Turkey has risen sharply recently. Most of them are coming from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Syria. Turkey is currently home to some 4 million refugees, which is the largest refugee population in the world. In your international sports news, Kevin Benavides of Argentina suffered heartbreak on the sixth stage of the Dakar rally from Hale to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, when his bike broke down. Benavides, who had been in ninth position, collapsed in tears as his hopes for the rally were extinguished. Ricky Barbeck of the United States extended his overall lead in the bike section when he won the stage, taking the lead from Joan Bereda boat of Spain by 94 seconds. In the car section, Stefan Peter Hansel won the sixth stage, with Spaniard Carlos Sainz looking forward to a rest day in Riyadh after stretching his overall lead to almost eight minutes. The sixth stage was a mini buggy one-two over the Saudi Arabian dunes. Sainz one minute 33 seconds slower than teammate and 13-time winner Peter Hansel with Qatari Al Atiya in third. Veteran Peter Hansel remained third overall, 16 minutes and 20 seconds off the lead, with Saudi Arabia's Yazid Al Raji fourth in a Toyota. Meanwhile, tragedy struck today's seventh stage when Portuguese rider Paulo Gonçalves died following a crash, organizers said. The 40-year-old hero motorsports rider taking part in his 13th Dakar rally since making his debut in 2006 suffered fatal injuries after a fall 276 kilometers into Sunday's special stage from Riyadh to Wadi al Tawzir. The organizers received an alert at 10.8 and dispatched a medical helicopter that reached the biker at 10.16 and found him unconscious after going into cardiac arrest Organizers said in a statement, following rescue, following efforts in an in at the site of the crash, Gonzalez was taken by helicopter to Lila Hospital, where he was sadly pronounced dead. Now, meanwhile, 23-time Grand Slam champion Serena Williams won her first title in three years and her first since becoming a mother with a victory over Jessica Pegula at the Auckland Classic this evening, 6-3, 6-4. This is the 38-year-old's first singles title since she won Australian Open in 2017 and her 73rd WTA title overall. Williams lost the Wimbledon and the US Open finals in 2018 and 2019 and retired from the 2019 Rogers Cup final. Following her win, Williams said that she would donate her prize money in Auckland and address she had worn to the Australian bushfire appeal. However, Williams is short of just one Grand Slam to tie Margaret Smith's record of 24 Grand Slam championships. But before we end tonight, tonight's news, to get a better understanding as to how the major news of last week will shape the news agenda of the coming week, other than a 24 brings you a brand new show from tonight. Join Mahesh Johnny every Sunday that's coming up right after the news. We hope you stick around for that. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Good night.